They call it day 5 to 13, approximately correct. And they show inside here developing follicles. There's a fascicular or graphene follicle. And they try to emphasize that the endometrial lining is thickening a little more. So the, these are good to look at. They kind of correlate the uterine cycle phase and the ovarian cycle phase. And you get the days of the monthly cycle there, too. That leaves... Um, Day 14 is what I call an ovulation. They give a range of day 13 to 15. They show the ovulation happening there. Now, this all doesn't happen at once, but they illustrate it that way, where fertilization would occur around here in the ampulla of the uterine tube, and they illustrate um, implantation right there, even though it would happen not the same day as fertilization and ovulation, usually a week later. Okay. But they do show it all together. Yeah. Remember that picture you showed us the other day of like the live egg coming out? Where yeah. here did, was that picture from? I'm just curious where it was. Uh, oh, um, I was sent the link and that was not given to anything else. Oh my, I was just curious if you yeah. I don't know, sorry. 
Okay. Uh, here's day 21, okay, and this is the secretory phase, and well, it's all the same information, but they do show the ovary in the teal phase. Okay, so that's kind of how it's modeled there on the board. Um, after you've studied this for uh, some time, go back and look at these review questions and see if you can answer them. I think this will really, after a few hours of studying this, if you can answer these easily, you'll be like, okay, yeah, I, I, I'm on it. Uh, but, you know, I know it's going to take some time. Uh, I would like to uh, proceed to the male reproductive physiology in the next batch of slides. I'll spend a lot of time outlining spermatogenesis. The formation of sperm. As the word implies, this is the genesis, the creation of sperm, and um, the process is threefold. Know that the cells that undergo spermatogenesis are known as the spermatogonium. These are the cells that live in the seminiferous tubules and don't undergo those three things, mitosis, meiosis, um, spermiogenesis, okay? Think of mitosis as um, as long as spermatogonium undergo mitosis, a man is fertile. Because if they just keep dividing, they'll just keep getting more sperm and that's fertility. For a man, this could happen well into their 60s and 70s. So a man can be fertile well into their elder, elderly years. Men can be fertile into their elderly years. Technically, el the elderly is considered age 65 plus. So that's mitosis. Now, meiosis is the process of taking, selecting some of these um, spermatogonium that are undergoing mitosis and having them undergo meiosis to divide the DNA in half. The goal is to generate haploid DNA. I'll just put an N. We're just supposed to know that. No, I'm sorry. I wrote mitosis twice. Meiosis, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you go from haploid to diploid. That's the goal. I'll, 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 I'll outline it. Now, one extra step for the sperm, which have to go on a journey, um, they have to swim quite a ways to fertilize the oocyte that's been ovulated. So they need to become swim ready. The morphological changes that occur are called spermiogenesis. And that is just, well, you're not dividing the DNA anymore. That's already occurred. I'll just say morphological changes that make the cell swim ready. <coughs> morphological changes. <coughs> that makes sperm swim ready. Looking for a rocket-shaped head, a mid-piece body, and a tail from locomotion, more or less. So morphology is important for this cell. So here's kind of a picture of the process. And they show you a, a, a sliver of a seminiferous tubule, which we looked at under the microscope. 
the semi-vitreous tubule. If I draw an entire cut tube, with a lumen. Draw a couple of spaces for sperm. Usually the more mature sperm will be stuck in the middle. Will, will be more towards the lumen. So if the hole in the middle is the lumen, the more mature sperm kind of with their head stuck in the sand, kind of like there. Okay. And um, the epithelial tissue that lines a seminiferous tubule, I should probably label that's what this is, seminiferous. It's a simple columnar type of epithelium. I won't draw it all the way around. But... <coughs> There's a cell nucleus. And they usually refer to these cells as the, the Sertoli cell or sustentacular cell, these columnar cells. Right, squeeze it at the top, so it's spectacular. Sometimes I still use the older term, sertoli. The sustentacular cells have, have tight junctions in between them. together. And I'm not drawing the cells all the way around, but imagine that those tight junctions create this partition. Okay. Tight junctions create these two compartments. This one from here to here, and this one from here to there. junctions between sus tentacular cells create basal and adluminal compartments. Subcompartments within seminiferous tubule. The one further out is basal. <clears throat> the one closer to the lumen is adjacent to the lumen, it's ad luminal. So think of it this way the mitosis is occurring in the basal compartment. And at that time, you, you just got regular brown cells. They're not rocket shaped yet. So all that up. Uh, regular round cell in the basal compartment undergoing mitosis <coughs> in the basal compartment. So that, that, this is the first step of spermatogenesis. Up at the top it says um, spermatogonium and it says mitosis as part of the sper spermatogenesis process. In a regular round cell, they say it's 2N and it divides into two cells, which are also 2N. It's regular mitosis, diploid. Okay. 
So pretend this cell divides into two cells. They usually sublabel them A and B, type A, type B. Each division, like for example, I did it here too. Um, so basically, you want to select half of these to become spur. You want the other half to remain in the basal compartment to continue to undergo mitosis so that the male can remain fertile. So the A's usually do that. Remain in basal compartment. They just continue mitosis. The bees are, I guess, um, pushed past the, um, the border into the tight junction border and pushed into the ad luminal compartment of the bee there. Okay. Pushed to add ad luminal compartment. For mitosis. I'm sorry, for my meiosis. For, my, for meiosis. We're done with that now. Meiosis. And what you want to do is now that it's being selected for the meiotic process, don't call them B anymore. They're called primary spermatocytes. Okay, so if you look at the figure, I'll try to follow it. B. Put some notes here. They're primary spermatocytes now. They're entering meiosis one. And they've already undergone the replication of the DNA, so they're diploid replicated. Okay? So call this cell that's now undergoing meiosis. It's 2NR. It's diploid replicated. And refer to this one cell as a primary spermatocyte, not B. process, all of these cells are being immersed into the, in the cytoplasm of the Sertoldi cell. That's why the illustration, I, I, didn't really, I really can't draw it, they're all in the yellow. The yellow is supposed to represent the cytoplasm of the sustentacular cell, and there's the nucleus of it. Okay. Being sustained by the sustentacular cells cytoplasm. This whole process is occurring here. So put a line because now we're done with mitosis entering meiosis one where one cell becomes two. And the ploidy is haploid replicated and R. And you call these two cells, you have two secondary spermatocytes. One cell becomes two, like the figure says, and now two cells will become four. second division. You need meiosis too. Because the information is haploid, but it's still replicated. So from the one primary spermatocyte, you get two secondary spermatocytes, and you get four early spermatids. those has haploid DNA, which is the goal. So I'm going to put an N. And we really, we know what it is. 
I put n going back to n r, referring to the previous meiosis lecture, I said it's 23 tetrads. And then after the first magnetic division is done, I said each of these two cells has 23 dyads. The, the information is still replicated. So what's in each of these? 23 single chromosomes. So done with the DNA division. The last process of spermatogenesis is to become sperm ready. So you go from a regular round cell here, and you, you go through this process of spermiogenesis to become sperm ready. So each of these will like you know turn into that rocket shape cell. From one you get four. The process of becoming swim ready is spermiogenesis. So, for mitosis to meiosis, both parts, meiosis one, meiosis two, to spermiogenesis gets you to here, right? Where your head is stuck in the sand. So, that, that's the whole spermatogenesis, those three things. All right, so that's this figure. There's a lot of information on it, I realize. If you look at a real, you could study all of these cells under a higher magnification. Um, I wouldn't have you do that. But what you can at least notice is that when you start to see the, the slender rocket-shaped head with the nucleus, you're starting to get more at the end of the spermiogenesis here. Um, when you get closer to the lumen, in the process of spermiogenesis is shown here. It's like the last 24 days. The whole thing, you're talking 70-ish days from beginning to end. But the last 24 days, you get the spermiogenesis. Okay. So I'm going to clear the board here. In one ejaculation, there will be approximately 300 million sperm. That's what you need for fertility. So these are being produced a lot. It's in the hundreds of millions. So in a man, they usually estimate the sperm making capacity in terms of gram of testicular tissue. This is just showing the last 24 days of spermiogenesis. I think the thing to note of all the changes that are happening, you're basically shedding the cytoplasm, you're putting the DNA in the nucleus, All that red thing, the nuke. Um, one thing that's happening is that's important for fertilization is the acrosome. The acrosome is derived from the Golgi apparatus. And it forms that acrosomal cap or helmet over the nuke. Let me write that down. The acrosome. is derived from the Golgi. Apparatus. So I'm going to draw it as a green helmet over the nuke. And it's double membrane here. It contains vesicles with lytic enzymes that will Weaken and soften when it gets close to the egg, and it'll spill onto the egg and help punch holes into the barrier surrounding the oocyte. Well, anyway, it's the acrosome. Then around that, you've got plasma membrane. Yeah, plasma membrane. And that's just the head of the sperm.
just one head. You can see there's a mid-piece and tail. There's kind of an um, engineer sketch of the proper uh, parts. Talked about the head, it's got haploid DNA. You have a neck, and then you have a mid-piece. mitochondria in there. For energy, mitochondria are for ATP, and all the way through there is an axis for a tail. For locomotion. So in an average ejaculation, you want about 100 million, well, the range is something like 20 to 100 million sperm per mil ejaculate. That's kind of standard there. Of these guys, 20 to 100 million sperm per mil of ejaculate. Typical ejaculation is about three to five minutes. You can do the math. It's, it's a few hundred million. Here's um, the real electron microscopy. 17,000 eggs to kind of see the details in the mid piece there. Okay. MI is mitochondria. Right. Well, anyways, moving on. Uh, that's kind of the formation and the structure of sperm or spermatozoa. Sometimes I also use the term spermatocyte. It's all called sperm. Um, going back to those sustentacular cells or sort of totally cells, I mentioned the tight junctions that forms. Well, I didn't mention this. Those junctions, <laughs> I thought I mentioned it. What I mentioned was it forms the basal and luminal compartments. I didn't mention how it forms the blood testes barrier. So let me write that down. Tight junction between Sertoli cells form a blood testes barrier. In whole blood, your immune system might see in a man the developing sperm is non self, so that it could attack them. So that barrier is pretty important for the developing sperm. All those other details, I think I did mention it. Um, it forms the basal luminal compartments. They're, they have a nurse function. Okay, so all the cells have a nice warm cytoplasm to undergo mitosis, meiosis. So basically we call that metabolic support for the developing spermatogenic cells. Their extensive cytoplasm envelops spermatocytes. The thing they show at the bottom here, they show sperm with heads stuck in the sand. The process of them breaking off the tubule wall and swinging away 
swimming away is called spermiation, yet another term. Spermiation. In the process of sperm breaking away from tubular wall, and they swim to red testes, efferent ductiles, to the epididymis. Maybe they'll be stored there for a while. Um, it's controlled by testosterone. Sometimes I abbreviate testosterone with a capital T, circle it. <clears throat> so you want the testosterone levels to be um, appropriate. If testosterone is too low, there's a couple of things that could go wrong. On one end, <clears throat> if you consider the tight junctions, testosterone maintains these tight junctions. What? So I'm writing maintains tight junctions. But if testosterone is too low, what could happen is the adhesions between tight junctions uh, breaks, and you could push the um, spermatocytes through too quickly, and they'll never develop. Okay, I'll say weakens tight junctions. Push spermatocytes through too quickly and they never develop. They don't go through that whole spermatogenesis that I outlined. The other consequence of low T. Let's say you have sperm that have developed. Testosterone is responsible for them breaking up, but if there's low T, they'll just kind of they stay stuck there and they'll just get gobbled up by the Sertoli cell. They'll just never leave. Never break off tubular wall. So testosterone is important for those uh, reasons. Now we have some models in the room. Now they're over there on that shelf. And they do show some of the meiosis process for males and females. This is for males. And um, we're, we're to identify the phase of mitosis. They're number five, six, and seven. And um, this one is on anaphase one. And when you get to anaphase two, shown here, we see that we have two cells uh, you have equal division of cytoplasm. Here you're separating the homologous chromosomes. And when you look at that, like I'm looking at this one here, you know, I, I can see that each of these is a double. It's hard to see on the picture, that's why we have a lot when you look at it as a person. But when you get to model number six, each of those is a single. They're separating the sister chromatids. This is towards the end of um, the whole process because you have swim ready sperm. So each of these cells would be N, 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 and N for each haploid. Okay. 23 single chromosomes. Now the female process is shown here. It's 8, 9, and 10. Um, here's a question. Is the division of the cytoplasm equal or unequal in this set? It's unequal. It's like all the cytoplasm is going to this cell and very little going to this. We call this the first polar body. 
well, this is becoming the first polar body. If you go from anaphase 1 to anaphase 2, this is the first polar body undergoing its own division. Well, I, we don't care about that. But this is the formation of the second polar body in anaphase 2. Here, this is completed. In each of these four nuclei, it's supposed to be N. Okay. But these three polar bodies, the reason why you have three, this is the second one. But these two came from the first one. All right, and this is what is supposed to be fertilized by sperm. Uh, I would say what is incorrect about this model set is you're only supposed to complete meiosis two when sperm is present. So um, I think we need to add a sperm trying to get in, right? Um, well, one small detail, I guess. Well, anyways, if I put models and mix them up and put them side by side and whatever, don't, don't let that confuse you. Like if I asked um, the biological sex, could you figure it out? Yeah. Female because of the unequal division of the cytoplasm. If they're both at phase one here and here. These are both at phase two. Okay. Well, getting back to males, um, the hormonal control of spermatogenesis uh, a little easier to understand for males and for females. There's not a cycle I have to teach. So we got growth hormone, um, gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. And that feeds um, on the um, gonadotropes, right? From amp hit. And those secrete FSH and LH. Now, FSH. That'll target, what they're showing you is it'll target the Sertoli cell in the seminiferous tubule, the sustentacular cell. LH will target the interstitial cells of Leydig. Stimulated. The interstitial cells, I mean, they're like the theca. Right? They, they secrete, well, in the male, they secrete you know, testosterone. The sustentacular cells will secrete androgen binding proteins. That's what the ABP on the figure stands for. They do what they say. They're going to sop up the testosterone. That'll help facilitate the spermatogenesis. Okay. Uh, well, the feedback is if you have high testosterone, you have enough, it'll negatively feed back. Turn off the gonadotropins. Okay, so dotted line, negative feedback. Um, that's pretty much it. And if you have low T, remove the negative feedback. Pretty much it for the math. There's no cycle, it's just, it's just feedback and a lot easier. What to teach? 
Okay. Um, the last slides in terms of physiology are the human sexual response, first kind of studied by Masters and Johnson. And most textbooks usually refer to their research. And what they've observed are four basic phases during the human sexual response, excitement, plateau, orgasm, resolution. And there's some gender differences. I'll go through the male ones first. And I'll focus on the physiology. Now this, I kind of already talked about. When I define erection, it's a parasympathetic event that involves nitric oxide that causes a vasodilation. It causes all of the um, erectile tissues, the erectile bodies, to engorge with blood. Corpus cavernosum and spongiosum, but also there's some scrotal swelling. So this is kind of during the excitement phase, using the other chart. Erectile dysfunction can be um, helped with well, drugs, nitric oxide. They basically make available nitric oxide. Okay. And so here's a status slide from one of the studies uh, done by Louis Nara, who won the Nobel Prize for this. Now, it was always known that nitroglycerin can have this relaxation effect, but he identified the molecule as nitric oxide. So what he did was he used um, cavernosum, I think it was from rabbits. And uh, remember, that, that's the erectile body that becomes hard during the erection. And so he's comparing, um, let's see, um, nitric oxide, nitroglycerin versus control. Okay, and there's much more relaxation, which means the um, tissue will become engorged with blood. So that's why nitric oxide is important for erection. In the plateau phase, we see our uh, maximal changes. You may see some fluid from the bulb urethral gland at the tip of the penis. The orgasmic platform in a man, it involves a few things here. There's a lot of contractions here. I mentioned the bulbal spongiosis muscle that provides three to five strong contractions followed by a few weaker ones. They're spread out about 0.8 seconds apart. And there's also some physiological changes here. One key thing for repro, orgasm is necessary for fertilization because the ejaculate has the sperm. Um, there's a contraction of all of these things, the prostate, the muscles I mentioned. Also, there's a contraction of the sphincter here to keep urine inside the bladder if there's anything in there. For resolution, everything returns to normal. Okay. Um, there's a refractory period. That's the key physiology. In physiology, refractory means a period of insensitivity. And that period of time is basically shorter in younger men and longer in older men. Now, the female sex response is more varied. And Masters and Johnson noticed a few different platforms in their study. I guess they generalized, they categorized three different categories, where one, similar to the male, you have um, a large rise, orgasm, and resolution. You have a, a second where there's a bunch of small um, little stimuli with a plateau, and, or you have a few big ones, okay? So they basically uh, found three general patterns of sex responses in females. But in the same four phases, in the excitement phase, there's increased vaginal lubrication, the glands of the pores swells, and there may be some other changes there. Uh, the key thing is that the ballooning of the vagina and the cervix gets out of the way. So what this does, it creates, it balloons the fornix, so you can create a seminal pool there during ejaculation. So this shows the plateau phase and it emphasizes the color changes in the labia. of it. The orgasm is similar to males. You have um, several contractions, maybe up to 12, spaced about 0.8 seconds apart. They could be repeated, like I said, they can follow different patterns. And there's a seminal pool, okay, that's important, so that when, during resolution, the cervix kind of dips down into the seminal pool when everything relaxes and goes back. Okay, so that's where the 300 million sperm have a chance to swim for fertilization. Okay. 
Okay. Well, um, there's no refractory period in women. And they report uh, women can be multi-orgasmic up to 5 to 20. And it's not age dependent. So I always say women get to have all the fun. Um, <laughs> there is no refractory period in women. There is in men. That's just what they say. <laughs> No, we'll pick it up there next time. I'm going to go in the lab time.